But then all of a sudden, bam, you are live. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday to everybody. Danielle, happy Friday to you. Another happy week Friday. of COVID lockdown, this, that, and the other thing <laughs> under the, under our belts. You know, what's, what's kind of weird about it, Danielle, is I'm. it's not a good thing. I'm kind of getting used to it. You know, it's kind of weird. You know, I guess we've just been doing it long enough now that it's kind of, you know, they talk about the new normal type thing, but I think part of it too probably gets to personality type. I'm an introvert. So it's kind of like probably not mm -hmm. as hard for me. I can imagine like my introvert friends, this, this has probably been a really rough, <laughs> rough time for them, right? No sporting events yeah. and things like that. How about you? Well, I mean, I've always worked from home and in Wisconsin, we don't normally leave our houses six months of the year because of winter. So <laughs> new normal feels very much like the regular normal for me in some cases. Nice. Well, of course, this is Food Safety Chat Friday. And so as we like to do, we like to start off here by saying hello to everybody here in the chat. So please, you know, let us know that you're out there listening to us. And our topic today is going to be food safety and caffeine and all the fun things with that. This is going to be a really interesting topic. Uh, tell us where you're from. Um, so like Danielle was talking about, I'm out in good old Loveland, Colorado, which is kind of up by Fort Collins. So if you're not familiar with Colorado, it's about an hour north of Denver. It's um, We had some snow roll through a couple days ago, nothing bad. Um, and it's about, it's already 28 degrees outside. The roads are already dry, which is pretty typical for Colorado. So um, I lived back east for a while, or through the winter, right? It, it snows and it just accumulates. Whereas in Colorado, it snows and melts and snows and melts. And what people don't realize either is that really February, March is when we get most of our snow here in Colorado. So you think you're through the rough part of it. Nope, it's just starting. That's when that's when it happens. Now, I understand in Wisconsin, where you're at, Danielle, you guys have had a relatively mild winter so far. Is that right? Ugh, I mean, I'm from SoCal, so it's hard for me to call anything <laughs> involving snow mild. But I suppose this has been not as cold as last year, but um, it's February, which means we're still due for one more giant snowstorm. This is the fool's spring that we're in right now. So we're due for much more snow before April, unfortunately. So just like <laughs> us then, yeah, exactly, how funny. So uh, yeah. once again, guys, everybody, this is Food Safety Chat Live. We do this every Friday. So 8 a.m. Mountain where I'm at, 9 a.m. where Danielle's at in Wisconsin, 10 a.m. On, on the East Coast. And I'm sorry for you West Coasters, it's a bright and early 7 a.m. for you, but we're glad uh -huh. you're going. Um, one of the things, Danielle, that we have on us as well, too, is a lot of times when people pop up and say hello in the chat, we get people from all over the world, uh, Turkey and all kinds of stuff, which is really cool. Um, so part of this is, and what we do here is unlike a webinar where you go and listen to a webinar and somebody talks on a topic and then at the end, a few people ask questions and you're done, and then you watch the recording afterwards, this is more interactive. So definitely everybody who's watching this, we want your questions. This is interactive and we want to get that back and forth to make sure we're getting you the information you need. Because today's topic and Danielle with Green Eyed Guide uh, has a very interesting area that she works in. So um, why don't you kind of tell everybody what's going on, Danielle? Sure. Um, is it okay if I introduce myself a little bit for those oh, who don't know me? Yes, please. All right. So for those that don't know me, I'm caffeine scientist, author, and speaker, Green Eyed Guide. I'm the host of the Caffeine at Midnight podcast, the founder of GED Research and Consulting at GreenEyedGuide.com, and I'm your guide to the science behind caffeine, energy drinks, and beating burnout. So March is Caffeine Awareness Month, and today I wanted to talk about three ways we can all improve our caffeine safety. Nice. Very good. Yeah, so I, that's super good talking. Speaking of caffeine, Danielle, one of the things we like to do here in the morning is yeah. have our drink. So everybody, if you've got your favorite caffeinated beverage, mine is coffee. What do you have, Danielle? Well, I have coffee today because it's coffee freezing cold. cold. So I don't, normally mm -hmm. I'm an energy drink drinker, but today it's too cold. So I'm going with a warm cup of coffee from fire department coffee. There you go. Uh, good morning, Jill, by the way. So everybody, please join us and uh, have your favorite caffeine beverage with us. Wonderful. Yeah, my wife switched me over to uh, like a more of a mild roast on the coffee. Mm -hmm. I mean, like if you go to Starbucks or if you go to Costco, everything is like, you know, super, super roasted, burnt to heck. And I'm liking this light roast. It's, nice, it's a nice change. Yeah. 
So um, caffeine, I mean, like we just did, right? This is something that in American culture around the world, things like this, caffeine is just part of, you know, it's not even really viewed as a drug, is it? Well, I mean, technically it is, but you're right. 90% of Americans of all ages have caffeine on a daily basis. So caffeine is everywhere. For a lot of people, it's just part of the routine, like putting on pants. You don't really think about it which means that you're maybe not as cognizant for all the ways that caffeine affects your life, your physical health and your mental health. So mm -hmm. that's some of the uh, things that I like to dig into when I'm working with a client. Excellent. So that's, that's very, let's, let's kind of talk about those. then. so like, so for the physical and mental house, what are some of the things that you discuss with your clients then? Well, one of the things that I talk about, and uh, I'll get into my my three tips for caffeine safety in a second here, but one of my favorite things to talk about with uh, caffeine is that what time of day you drink your caffeine, how quickly you drink your caffeine, and where that caffeine comes from, whether it's tea or coffee or an energy drink or a pre-exercise powder, all of those tiny details make a huge difference in your physical health and your mental health. For example, about 65% of employed Americans are struggling with burnout right now, and caffeine is the number one coping mechanism. However, while caffeine can boost your mood and your focus, it cannot compensate for emotional exhaustion. It can't cure that type of tiredness. So when I'm working with a client, we'll talk about the different ways they're currently drinking caffeine the different ways that they can change their caffeine habits to get more oomph from their caffeine and the different strategies they can use mentally or physically that don't involve caffeine that can help them combat or manage that emotional exhaustion and that stress. Wow. That's, that's, wow. That's a ton of stuff there. Um, so <laughs> the mechanism which it's going in is impacting it really. That's yes. I didn't know that. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's a few studies that looked at people that consumed 32 ounces of an energy drink in 30 minutes. And those people in that study had an increase in blood pressure and an increase in heart rate. But that effect goes down or it's muted when you sip your caffeine over hours. So, I mean, there are many different ways that you can make your caffeine last throughout the day, whether you're sipping it slowly from something like a Yeti cup that's going to keep it warm, or mm -hmm. if you're just having smaller doses of caffeine throughout the day, that makes a huge difference in how that caffeine affects you physiologically. Hmm. Interesting. Now, one of the things that I've heard, I don't know if this is true or not, do people become tolerant to caffeine? Absolutely. Actually, I should probably just dive into my three tips because we're hitting a lot of those, uh, a lot <laughs> of those questions. So as I mentioned, Cafe, uh, March is Caffeine Awareness Month. And so there are three huge tips that I have for everyone in order to improve our caffeine safety. And it, this involves a lot of the things you mentioned, like tolerance and addiction and dependence. So the very first tip I have for people with caffeine safety is, number one, you have to know your caffeine. Brian, do you know how much caffeine you can have in a day? No, I don't. <laughs> a lot of people don't. It's 400 milligrams or four cups of coffee. So that's the amount you can have in a day before the side effects of caffeine start outweighing the benefits of caffeine. So as long as you stay under 400 milligrams per day, then you're less likely to feel side effects like um, sleep interruption or increase in blood pressure or nausea, upset stomach, you know, increase in anxiety. All of those side effects usually come when people have over that 400 milligrams per day. But here's another question, Brian, do you know how much caffeine you can have at a time? Hmm. Well, I'm assuming one cup is okay, so 200? Perfect, yes, that's a great guess. So according to the European Food Safety Authority, you can have 200 milligrams of caffeine at a time. Now this is tricky because there are plenty of 300 milligram caffeine energy drinks out there. So that's above the recommended amount you can have at one time. What that means is that by going over 200 milligrams in one dosage, then you are more likely to have that increase in blood pressure and a change in heart rate. I mentioned a little earlier that there's some studies on caffeine and blood pressure, caffeine and heart rate. The biggest study I know, the one I like pointing to is in the Journal of the American Heart Association. In that study, they gave people 
caffeine and uh, some like lime juice and cherry juice, like a placebo. And then they also gave them an energy drink with 300 milligrams of caffeine. I think it was also ginseng and B vitamins. But the problem is in that study, all of the participants, even the placebo group, had an increase in blood pressure and an increase in heart rate. That's because they consumed more than that 200 milligrams you should have at one time. And also they consumed 32 ounces of it as opposed to a standard energy drink, which is eight ounces or 16 ounces. So right. that's just one example of how you can improve caffeine safety by being cognizant of how much caffeine you can have in a day, how much caffeine you can have at one time, and how much caffeine is in what you're drinking. Hmm. So that's then, that's my first tip. Yeah, that's a great one. And a quick question on that. So like a, a cup, then is that just like eight ounces? Is that what's considered a cup? Yes. So even though the caffeine content in a cup of coffee varies wildly by the type of beans, the type of roasting method, whether it's drip or French press, et cetera, we typically use 100 milligrams as a quote unquote standard cup of coffee. Again, it really depends on where you're getting your coffee, if it's Starbucks or the gas station. But that's the amount that people typically use when they're saying our drink has as much caffeine as a standard cup of coffee. That's what they're referring to, 100 milligrams. Gotcha. Well, that, that first tip is really good, right? So you need to know your caffeine intake. So I, I'm taking yeah. notes here. This is really good stuff. What, what's what's number two? Tip number two is I want people to think of energy drinks like cereal. Hmm. Because when you talk about cereal, there's a big difference between Lucky Charms and Oat Bran. There's a huge <laughs> spectrum. And so it is with energy drinks. So let me show you a little bit of my collection just to demonstrate what I mean. So. I don't know if you can see this here, but oh, I've got, perfect. there we go. Then we've got Starbucks triple shot energy and monster uh, monsters coffee uh, version. So okay. that's an example of energy drinks that kind of look like coffee. Here's an example of energy drinks that are fueled by tea. We have Bible energy tea and we uh -huh. have Marquise, which is green tea, yerba mate and green coffee beans. So those mm -hmm. are energy drinks, but they are, they are fueled by green tea. And then we have the clean energy drinks like Kill Cliff Ignite and also Life Aids Focus Aid, which I don't have a can with me because I drank it all and my two year old squished it. So I had, to, I had to put that one in the recycling. And then we have the stereotypical energy drinks that everyone thinks of like yeah. Rockstar, sorry, like um, Monster Rockstar, Red Bull and Bang. Right. But here's, here's the trick question of all of those drinks that I just showed you, Brian, can you guess which one has the most caffeine per container? No. And th th what's interesting, this is where like marketing and packaging get really in, right? So my perception as a consumer would be that the tea one with the yerba mate and these type of things, it would be the healthiest one. Uh, so I would say that would be the one with the um, least amount of damage to me as it would be. Um, that would be my guess. And which one do you think has the most amount of caffeine? Which one do you think is the strongest? I would go the, with the ones with the most vibrant color and the ones looking the craziest. I would probably go with the Monster Coffee. That's a good guess. So actually, this can of Bang is equivalent to three cans of Red Bull. Wow. Right? Holy so God. when energy drinks first came out, everyone thought that they were loaded with high caffeine and, uh, high caffeine and sugar. But that was, you know, back when Red Bull was the number one selling energy drink. Now, with Bang's success, Red Bull is still number one, but there are more and more drinks coming out with 300 milligrams of caffeine in them. So when we talk about energy drinks, the reason I want people to talk about energy drinks like cereal is that you can't talk about all of these drinks, the coffee ones, the tea ones, the clean ones, the Bang, all like they're the same. It really matters what's the amount of caffeine and it matters what the food matrix is or the, those other ingredients in there. So to help people understand the difference between the cleaner ones with the lower caffeine and the stronger ones that may not seem like they're as dangerous as they really are, I put together an energy drink report card. So this is at greeneyedguide.com slash freebies. My energy drink report card has three different categories for the top selling energy drinks. And I'm not just talking about Red Bull. I'm talking about the coffee ones and the tea ones that I showed as well. In that energy drink report card, I have a column of drinks that are green, drinks you can drink every day. 
and then I have a column of yellow. These are okay from time to time, kind of like a pizza. Like it's okay every once in a while, but you don't want it every single day, right? And then I have energy drinks in the red. Like don't ever drink these. These have way more um, implications on your health. So you want to avoid those. So that's my energy drink report card. And that helps people see the spectrum of energy drinks, just like there's a spectrum of cereals. So that's tip number two. Just, huh. you know, start talking about energy drinks like we talk about cereal. Embrace the spectrum. Right. Yeah. So don't lump them all together. There's wild differences between them. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Awesome. That's an amazing. What's, what's number three? I'm, I really want to know what three is now. All right. So this last tip here of to avoid your caffeine overdose, dependence, your addiction and your withdrawals. I recommend a I recommend drinking caffeine by the five levels of fatigue. The five levels of fatigue is a pyramid. It's a system that I developed in grad school while I was drinking caffeine, going to school full time and juggling two part time jobs. This is a system that helps me avoid overdosing on caffeine because in this system, I recognized when I just needed water and walking around, not caffeine, or when I was fatigue level five of five and no amount of caffeine could save me, I needed to sleep. So at mm -hmm. every level of fatigue, there's a different energy drink or a different type of coffee that I recommend. And there's a different set of exercises you can do that don't involve caffeine, like sleeping or like walking around or like talking to a friend that makes you laugh. For every level, there's a proportionate response, which means that you're not having more caffeine than you need, which means you don't develop an addiction or you don't develop tolerance because you're only getting as much caffeine as you need when you need it. And you have this whole toolbox of other things you can try when you're stressed out or sleep deprived. And that's mm -hmm. actually, let me show you here. So that's what I went into in more detail in my latest book, um, how to get sh done when you feel like, sh <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to swear here. So that's the title of the book. And this goes into more details about the five levels of fatigue, but those are the exercises I go through with nurses and teachers and first responders, people that are struggling with sleep deprivation and stress on a day-to-day -day basis because of their occupation. Hmm. Where, so, where can people find your book, Danielle? Oh, it's on Audible and it's on Amazon in ebook format. It's like two dollars and ninety nine cents cheaper than a cup of coffee. Uh, and you can also get a paperback version. Nice, nice. So then people who are way out of whack in this caffeine pyramid, right? And they're drinking bang and all these crazy things like that. And they're they're way addicted to these. How do they then start backing themselves back because that's part of what people always worry about too right is oh geez i got this caffeine headache and i don't want to go through that and how do, how do people get back to a normal state well it it comes slowly it comes stepwise that's one of the reasons i feel like my workshops are different than other workshops on burnout or nutrition i don't encourage people to quit caffeine cold turkey because i feel like that's the hard way to do it instead i help people go down um, a little bit by a little bit. So for example, I used to work with a, a couple of bartenders that would have two cans of monster before their shift. Mm. I was able to get them down to a half a can every other day by teaching them how much caffeine do you really need to feel that buzz? What if you only had one and a half cans today and maybe you only had one and a half cans next week. So you, you decrease it stepwise by really focusing on your mindset before you have any caffeine have water to make sure that you're not just tired because you're dehydrated, and then sip your caffeine slowly. When you do that, you may realize you don't need all, you know, all three cups of coffee. You may feel alert enough in the second cup. And so maybe next week we work on only going one cup. You reduce it stepwise and we focus on, you know, your mindset uh, before you crack open that second can or brew another cup. Well, you know, what's funny is even as we're sitting here talking, I'm becoming more aware of, you know, just, you know, picking up my cup and drinking and picking up. It's just a habit, right? You don't even really think about it. But now that I am, I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here doing this and taking this caffeine in. I'm not even really aware of it. It's just part of the routine. Absolutely. So one of my favorite tips. Uh, so full disclosure, I have a two year old and then I have a, a baby girl that's about to turn one. So my mornings are pure chaos. So there are some mornings. <laughs> that my caffeine is the only thing that gets me out of bed. What I've learned is that if you have caffeine within the first hour of waking up, 
your body is going through this hormonal cascade of changes called the cortisol awakening response. So your caffeine is actually less effective if you have it within the first 60 minutes of waking up. So what I do is I just microwave a cup of water and I pretend like it's coffee. The placebo effect does all the work for me. It gets me through that first hour of chaos in the mornings. And then by the time I get the kids to school, by the time I'm ready to start my day, I brew a real cup of coffee. And then that caffeine actually has a chance to affect me. But the placebo effect got me through to that point. Wow, that's, huh, I had no idea. So that first hour coffee does you no good? Well, it's kind of like yelling when the TV's up on full volume. Like it's working in your body, but there's so many other things going on that the effect is muted because there's just so many other things causing that same stimulation that caffeine will cause. Huh. Wow, that's really cool. I'm writing that one down too. <laughs> one hour, don't drink coffee. Very interesting. Um, so on the regulatory side, so we have all of these cans that you that you put up here and you have big cans and little cans, right? We're kind of used to the size of the Red Bull. Um, how many servings are in some of these cans? Are these all one serving size or not? They are all one serving now. The FDA just changed, I always forget the acronym, but basically they changed the rules that say you can't put this one can as two servings. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's like the record. Oh gosh, someone, someone in the chat will probably remember this acronym. But basically, um, they the rules say that if you have one can like this that's 16 ounces, you have to call it one serving because everyone is going to treat it like one serving. Everyone right. except for me, of course. I'm the weirdo that usually drinks half a can and puts the rest in the fridge for the next day. But most people, most people treat it like one serving. So now the labels reflect that. Right. And so then under FDA regulations, this is, is this all right? I guess we should just settle that first too. Yes. This is all regulated by FDA, correct? Yes. So it is a myth when people, sorry, it is, it is incorrect when people say energy drinks are not regulated. That's not true. Even supplements are regulated by the FDA, but they're just regulated differently. There's new dietary ingredients, there's pre-market approval, there's grass regulations. Those are differences between whether something is marketed with a supplement facts panel or a nutrition facts panel. All of these drinks that I have in front of me are marketed as foods and beverages. They all have a nutrition facts panel, which means that all of the ingredients must be generally recognized as safe, and they are all marketed under the FDA's food and beverage umbrella. Okay. Good. So then it sounds like, all right, so if we have big cans and little cans and some cans had 300 milligrams and some were less than that, and they're one serving, is, mm -hmm. does FDA have any guidelines or regulations saying how oh. much? No, unfortunately not. So Health Canada has regulations that say you cannot have more than, uh, it's 400 milligrams of caffeine per liter, which basically equates to 250 milligrams per um, or uh, gosh, I'm converting metrics in English here, uh, 250 milligrams per eight ounce can, I think. Um, and the FDA doesn't do that. They do for sodas, for cola beverages. In the FDA laws, you cannot have more than 72 milligrams of caffeine per 12, an uh, 12 ounce soda, but those regulations only apply to cola beverages. So years ago, Red Bull figured out, well, if we're not cola, this rule doesn't apply to us and we can put as much caffeine as we want. Thankfully for us, Red Bull was responsible and they didn't go crazy with the amount of caffeine. Other companies were less responsible with that loophole. And so I really wish the FDA would update the, the regulations for cola beverages and just take out the word cola, make it applicable to all caffeinated beverages, and then they can follow Health Canada's footsteps and set a cap, a limit on how much caffeine you can put per can. That's the, probably the best way we can control caffeine safety and caffeine overdose at the manufacturing level, not trying to ban energy drinks for minors. I feel like that's not a, as effective as the FDA setting that caffeine cap. Yeah, that makes sense. And a lot of times too with kids, whatever you make forbidden makes them want it even more. Right? Yes, exactly. So I, I don't think a ban is the way to go. I think the FDA needs to update the uh, cola grass caffeine limitation. Wow, I didn't know that. So what about these stories that you hear out here, Danielle, of somebody who drank eight cans and died? Are, are, are those things true or? 
Yes, unfortunately, there is a number of hospitalizations associated with either caffeine overdosing or caffeine combined with alcohol. There is a big report, in fact, a stat I see all the time is that energy drinks doubled the number of of caffeine-related hospitalizations in the period between 2007 and 2011. What's missing from that stat that people just throw into articles all the time is that during that period, there was a drink called Four Loco, which was way too much caffeine, way too much alcohol, all in one neat little can. And so this blackout in a can was partly responsible for this record number of energy drink related hospitalizations. It was too much caffeine and too much alcohol altogether, which is a dangerous combination. That's part of the reason hospitalizations have spiked. But these days, even though Four Loco no longer has caffeine, when I see a story about someone hospitalized because of energy drinks or caffeine, it's because they combined caffeine with alcohol or other drugs or they had 25 cans of Red Bull in one day. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I remember that. So, so you're taking a stimulant and combining it with a depressant. Yes, yes. Not a good idea. Because I remember, yeah, it didn't it used to be a trend. I don't know if kids do this anymore or not. I feel old all of a sudden. But didn't yeah, they were <laughs> right? Red Bull with vodka or something like that, right? Yeah. And they treated like a mixer, right? Yeah. And... I mean, I hate to admit this, but scientifically, there is a small amount of caffeine you can mix with alcohol and still be okay. Um, Mm. Basically, the European Food Safety Authority looked at the effects of caffeine and alcohol together. They said, as long as you stay under one cup of coffee or under the amount of alcohol needed to cause 0.08 in blood alcohol content, then you're fine. You can mix that together. But I mean, realistically, if you go well, if you have two beers and you combine that with two cups of coffee, then you're over that. So really, we're looking at one cup of coffee and one alcoholic beverage. That's it. That's as much as you com- can combine together and be okay. Wow. Um, so this is something I was thinking about earlier that I didn't bring up. So then the the limit then for the amount of, of caffeine for the, your daily intake, the 400 milligrams, is that in mm-hmm. any way related to weight? So if you're, if you're a big guy or, or a little person or a little gal, something like that? Um, I mean, it can fluctuate somewhat. The 400 magic number that I get comes from a a systematic review of all of the studies we have available on caffeine and health. So that looks at how many cups of coffee people have in one day and then their health, you know, later on. So 400 milligrams was pretty much the scientific consensus between all of the countries involved in this systematic review. Um, including Health Canada, European Food Safety Authority, US FDA, 400 milligrams is kind of the consensus, even though there might be small fluctuations in your own weight. That's just the general the general recommendation for the general population. Okay, gotcha. Right. Yeah, because you have to look at it in those terms. Is, is there anything going on out there in the energy drink market? All right. So we were talking about caffeine and alcohol and things like that. Are they combining them with other things that are having other weird synergistic relationships? So, you know, dietary supplements or, or things like this, ginseng or, or things like this, where they're combining with caffeine and it's being even weirder. Um, I mean, there's no combination that would surprise me anymore. Someone approached me about making um, caffeinated, like a caffeinated vape, and I did not think that was a good idea. <laughs> um, but in terms of how caffeine is being used. I'm seeing caffeine in chocolate, caffeine in candy, caffeine in shampoo, caffeine in face wash, caffeine with tea, caffeine in coffee, caffeine with all sorts of exercise uh, uh, workout supplements in like pre-workout powders. So I think as the caffeinated market continues to evolve, we're seeing all new um, ingredient combinations. And it's impossible to keep track of all of this, which again is why it's important to talk about energy drinks like cereal, because we need to focus on what are the ingredients in this thing that sent somebody to the hospital. That way we can get a better hold of the ingredient interactions that might be problematic. Hmm, interesting. So as far as the manufacturers in, right? So Red Bull, which started what in Asia, correct? I think it was what, Thailand or something like that? Thailand, um, yep. So with any dr- energy drinks in the U.S., who, who's manufacturing these products? Is it big companies? Is it a combination of little guys and big guys? What's, who are the manufacturers? It's a combination. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's a combination. I mean, there are definitely big companies like Red Bull is, is huge worldwide. And then there are smaller companies like um, this Viable Energy Tea, which I've been drinking this week. 
uh, they're made out of New Jersey and they're a small company. You know, they're, they're not very large, but they're doing pretty well based on their Instagram marketing and their Facebook marketing. And they're a good brand with a good story. So I feel like certain customers want the big brands. Certain customers want a smaller brand with a story, a trustworthy brand. So it's all over the place in terms of the energy drink market and the size of the manufacturers. Interesting, yeah, because that, that kind of gets to the manufacturing side of things, right? So uh, larger companies that may be manufacturing these drinks have more resources internally, right? They have, you know, marketing groups, they have, you know, laboratories, testing abilities, things like that to make sure they're getting all these things right. Whereas smaller companies, you know, they may have to source these things out to get that type of work done. Absolutely, absolutely. Hmm. So within, so let's say now we'll, we'll look at this from a manufacturing food safety standpoint. So if, if I'm a quality manager working in a beverage company that's manufacturing one of these drinks, what are some of the things that I need to be looking for to make sure that these are being formulated correctly and that we're not causing an issue with consumers? Well, the number one thing you have to know for sure is how much caffeine you're putting in your beverage. I see mm -hmm. a lot of quality personnel or even product developers that want the caffeine down here, but then the marketing person says, no, no, we'll sell so many more cans if we put this much caffeine in it. And right. there's this constant battle between the quality person or the product developer and the marketing team. So that's the first thing. We, we can't compromise on caffeine safety based on chasing sales. The second tip I'd have for the quality person is you really have to know your ingredients um, there may be an ingredient that's, again, attractive on a marketing perspective, like branch chain amino acids. But are you going to be able to put enough of that ingredient in your product to actually give somebody a benefit? Or are you just doing clickbait on a can? Are you just putting it on there to look good and to try and sell something? So I'd ask people to be really conscious about that when you're formulating your product. And then the third thing is, let's say you want to have curcumin or turmeric in your product. Again, there's some marketing behind the benefits. It's like immune boosting, allegedly, but it's really difficult to manufacture because it's this bright yellow powder that gets everywhere. And if you have enough of a dose to do something meaningful, it's also enough of a dosage to clog up some of your machines. So it's this balance between can we provide an effective dose? Can we actually manufacture this safely without breaking equipment. <laughs> yeah, because it, it seems like just from a manufacturing standpoint with, I mean, this is a relatively minor ingredient in these drinks and getting the formulation correct and not, you know, accidentally overdosing it or, you know, it doesn't really hurt if you underdose it, but if you overdose it, it seems like it'd be pretty easy to do that. Yeah. There were some cases in Australia where people overdosed on pure caffeine powder because mm -hmm. If you're talking about pure caffeine powder, it doesn't take a whole lot to kill you. I mean, 400 milligrams is like what you could fit on the head of a pencil, I mean, a very large pencil. But, you know, you're talking about scooping a tablespoon of caffeine powder like you would scoop a tablespoon of ground coffee. It's not going to be the same because it's pure powder. The risk is much, much higher. So you have to be very careful, very diligent about your manufacturing practices. Because yeah, I, I know my, my main background in manufacturing is dairy and a lot of, you know, in fluid milk, you need to supplement with vitamin D and that's a liquid that's metered into the process and it's really easy. And you've seen recalls over this where the vitamin D has been in, incorrectly dosed. So mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Now with the, with the source of the caffeine itself, then, so it sounds like the manufacturers are getting a powder. Now from my amateur understanding of this, it, a lot of caffeine used to be sourced from the decaffeination of, of coffee and things like this, but I doubt there's a whole lot of decaffeinated coffee out there now. Where, where, where is this ca caffeine coming from? Well, nowadays we're seeing beverages with caffeine in all kinds of sources. There's products that actually have like brewed coffee in them. Like one of the, uh, this monster one, the caffeine is coming from brewed coffee and it's coming oh. from guarana. So they're using their caffeine from a natural source. Other drinks, they're having, they have uh, green coffee beans in there. So they're not using pure caffeine. They're actually using like the green coffee bean with the caffeine in it. So it really depends on the drink. There's a whole variety of sources of caffeine out there. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. So um, what type of activity? So March, as you said, is uh, Caffeine Safety Awareness Month. What, what's going on yeah. with that? Well, um, Usually this time of year, I host a big event where I have speakers on, you know, speakers from coffee shops, speakers, <laughs> all kinds of speakers talking about 
all things caffeine. Unfortunately, due to COVID restrictions, I was un uncomfortable with bringing people into a closed location. So I have Caffeine Awareness Month in a box. At caffeinecon.org, I have these little boxes of caffeinated treats. There is one just for the coffee lovers that just has coffee and other promo codes for different coffee manufacturers. And then there's a box of all kinds of caffeinated treats, caffeinated chocolate, caffeinated mints, energy drinks, clean energy drinks. It's, it's a variety pack of caffeinated treats. And in each box, I have little postcards of important caffeine facts, like how much caffeine is in a cup of coffee, how much caffeine can you have, how do you know if you've had too much caffeine, all of those important steps that you can take as a consumer to make sure you're consuming caffeine safely, you'll get that little flyer in your little box as well as the caffeinated treats. So that's what I'm doing instead of having a full event. And you can find all of those details at caffeinecon.org. So that was caffeine. I'm going to this down here. Did you say con, C-O-N? The, the website is caffeinecon.org. Dot org. Caffeinecon.org. Cool. I'm going to yeah. check that out. So that was an interesting point that you just brought up too. So what type of trends are you seeing out there then, Danielle, around new things that caffeine is being put into? I'm seeing a lot more caffeine in food, which is kind of exciting because I'm the type of person that really likes having chocolate on Fridays. And so there's this brand of chocolate, uh, caffeinated chocolate bars called Awake. Um, and also, uh, What's the uh, Boosted Chews? Boosted Chews is made right here in Wisconsin from a group uh -huh. of students from University of Wisconsin Madison. And those are my favorite breakfast. That's my favorite new trend is having these, these caffeinated little tiny chews. And thankfully, the amount of caffeine in them is really small. So you don't have to worry about overdosing. It would take like a whole bag of Boosted Chews to overdose. So I can enjoy my chocolate, I can get my caffeine, and I can actually eat kind of a breakfast. Maybe chocolate isn't a real breakfast, but it's it's more enjoyable than having just caffeine from a can on certain days. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So another potential product as you were talking about that I was thinking about is, so we have all kinds of energy bars and things like this. Have they been putting caffeine into energy bars? Yes. Yes. I see a lot of uh, bars that either have like coffee beans or they have some kind of green tea added to it or they just have regular caffeine added to it or maybe dark chocolate and they they boost the caffeine in the dark chocolate coating these are more of the types of trends that i'm seeing on the sports supplement side than mm. like the grocery like the, the regular food side interesting interesting so as if you're a manufacturer making these type of products and you're responsible for food safety within that facility what what type of things should they be looking for in their food safety plans from suppliers and other things? What, what type of tips would you have for manufacturers? Well, supplier verification is going to be very, very important. Um, where you get your cane matters a great deal. You need to make sure that you can trust your supplier. You need to make sure your supplier is following their own HACCP plan or their own safety verification plan because I used to work in a manufacturing, a, suppl a supplement manufacturer, uh, sorry, supplement manufacturing company. And I was privileged to taste different types of stevia. You would think stevia is a natural sweetener. So stevia, stevia, stevia. That's not the case. There is some stevia made in facilities that have very poor manufacturing controls or poor extraction methods. And so the stevia is poor quality and it leaves this really strong, bitter metallic taste in your mouth. Mm. So with stevia and with caffeine, with all of your ingredients, you need to do due diligence and go up the food chain, uh, sorry, up the supply chain and make sure that your suppliers have all of the necessary controls to make sure their extraction methods are top notch, their manufacturing is clean and transparent, and that they're following all of the regulations in terms of employee safety, manufacturing uh, uh, cleanliness that they need to. It's not as simple as just getting a certificate from your supplier saying, yes, we've been audited. You need to do, you know, dig deeper into their processing flowchart and make sure that they're controlling for all of the uh, all of these critical control steps. Hmm. Interesting. So where, where is a lot of the caffeine manufactured in the world then? Oh, my goodness. Well, it's it's honestly it's hard to keep track. Um, a lot of the coffee beans come from South America. And gosh, you're testing my, my geography. Um, I feel like caffeine is coming from all all sources. I mean, Guarana comes um, gosh, where does Guarana come from? Well, I'd have to double check my book. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't I, I don't actually know that question. Um, I usually deal with the caffeine once it's put into the beverage. So where it's coming from varies wildly. I mean, obviously, they're the big manufacturers, but I'm not exactly sure where exactly it comes from. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, these are yeah, questions. <laughs> good question. you, measure, right? you need to put those things on and treat this like any other ingredient. Um, is caffeine then so coffee and things like that? Do, is anybody synthesizing caffeine or are they sourcing it from natural sources? A little bit of both. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So that's a big part of your food safety plan then too, is how is that actually being sourced? Um, and mm -hmm. I would imagine as well too, contaminants within that caffeine as well and, and food fraud. People may mm -hmm. be taking that caffeine and cutting it with other things or heavy metal contamination or, or who knows what within those things, depending upon that source. If it's coming from coffee, you may have to worry about pesticides as well or something like that, I would think. Yes. Pesticides and heavy metals for sure. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. So lots of things for the for the food safety professionals in the manufacturing side, the things to think about as well. I think what's kind of interesting with this conversation, too, and this is kind of a good way to kind of circle back on what we were talking about, is it's 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 there's a lot of responsibility. I'm thinking what I'm hearing, Danielle, is on the consumer to understand what they're ingesting and what they're putting in their body and how they're actually dosing this. Just because you can buy it doesn't mm -hmm. mean you can chug a whole bunch of this stuff. Yes. One hundred percent. Well said. Hmm. Very interesting. So um, not seeing any questions at this point right now. Um, any Anything you, you would like to close with or um, uh, anything else you'd like to share with the group? Well, so I'll just recap. Uh, for those that are interested in the different types of energy drinks, again, going back to the energy drinks as cereal spectrum, you can find my energy drink report card at greeneyedguide.com slash freebies. The energy drink report card is there and you can download it and see the different energy drinks that I'd recommend every day versus the ones that I recommend staying away from. Um, and furthermore, you can find both of my books like this one, Are You a Monster or a Rockstar? A Guide to Energy Drinks. This is on Audible. You can get this on Kindle. You can get this in paperback or hardcover or ebook. You can get this wherever books are sold. Your local library might even be able to order it. That's the first book that goes into energy drink ingredients and the different things that make energy drinks dangerous or safe. And then if you're more of a coffee drinker or someone that just deals with stress and sleep deprivation, this book is more about managing that stress and sleep deprivation. It's not as specific on energy drink ingredients. It's more about big picture. How can you drink caffeine strategically? How can you manage every level of fatigue? And again, this book is available on Amazon. How to get shit done when you feel like shit. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you're able to bleep yourself. That's awesome. Uh, Ryan here had a question. Uh, can you share that link in this chat? Absolutely. So the, the freebie link, make sure I got this right, greeneyeguide.com yep. slash freebie, correct? Freebie. Freebie is with an S. Yep. Mm -hmm. F-R-E-E-B-I-E? -E? Uh, F-R-E-E-B-I-E-S. S. Good. Glad I asked that. So greeneyedguide.com freebies. I am going there after this conversation as well. So got that in there. And so, of course, Danielle's email is here. So info, info at greeneyedguide.com. So you can reach out to her. Uh, my email is here as well. So brian at foodsafetyfoundation.com. Wow. This is amazing conversation, right? So um, food safety covers all kinds of aspects in our lives that we sometimes don't even really think about that we just take for granted. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, Danielle, I really appreciate you taking the time to meet with us today and go over this. Um, I've, I've learned a ton. This has been amazing. And definitely Good. everybody go out to Green Eyed Guide and check that out and, and get Danielle's freebies. I know I'm going to. I want to see the pyramid. That sounds really cool. So yes, uh, yes. have a great weekend and appreciate all you do. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Bye, everybody.